for those who, who perhaps wonder why, um, if I'm, uh, my experience and my expertise is on the Persian Gulf, um, I'm talking about uh, uh, Israel's offshore gas and how that fits into the energy perspective of the Middle East. It's because uh, uh, it was a great new subject uh, when it emerged a few years ago, uh, and nobody else grabbed it, and I grabbed it, and it's been a great subject to, to deal with. Um, I'm also pleased that uh, Sir Michael and Brenda are with me this afternoon. When uh, Rob Satloff asked me to put the panel together uh, for this afternoon, uh, he said, give me a list of people who you would like to invite. Uh, Michael and Brenda were the top of my list, and so um, uh, I, it's always very pleasing when you have to, don't even have to get as far as number three. <laughs> um, and uh, I've been... Uh, uh, working with them on uh, the gas issue uh, and uh, in the eastern Mediterranean for a couple of years now, and it's been a great pleasure. Uh, it, the energy subject as such is enormous, so we're just going to take a slice of it today, um, but it will, we will relate uh, uh, as necessary uh, to how it fits into the, whole, the global picture and the regional picture, um, and... Uh, Brenda is useful here because uh, of her experience in Azerbaijan, uh, a not insignificant uh, energy player in its uh, own right. Now, you should have three pieces of paper. And if you haven't got three pieces of paper, uh, stick up your hand and three pieces of paper uh, will, uh, will head down in your direction. Um, sorry, the... We've run out of that one? Yes. Okay, well, some of you might have to share on that one. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you've, uh, or unless you suddenly discover you're sitting next mm -hmm. to a whole pile, which is, uh, <laughs> in which case, bring them down, bring them down. Um, right. Um, the uh, one piece of paper is, um, is the U.S. Geological Survey, the first page of a report uh, that they produced in 2010. Uh, and um, gas in the eastern Mediterranean was first discovered in 1999. But in 2010, uh, the U.S. Geological Survey produced this report, um, which essentially looked at uh, uh, geological uh, data as we knew it. And... Uh, then figured out, took a guess, made a forecast about how much uh, oil and gas might be in this region, which is known as the Levant Basin. Uh, and um, uh, they came up uh, with uh, 1.7 billion barrels of oil and 122 trillion cubic feet of recoverable gas. Uh, now, unless you are very familiar with energy... Uh, these just appear large numbers, uh, and but the, give you no particular perspective. But but the particular perspective I want you to uh, understand for this afternoon is that 1.7 billion barrels of oil sounds a lot, but in the great scheme of things, it's too big. But the 122 trillion cubic feet of uh, gas is rather interesting. Uh, now, uh, the interesting thing about what we've got so far is that the amount which has currently been discovered is about a quarter of that 122 trillion uh, cubic feet of gas. So this is why people are still interested in looking uh, for more. Uh, some of it's off Gaza. Uh, some of it is off Israel. Uh, Cyprus has found a bit as well. And... Um, uh, Lebanon is going to start looking. Um, and uh, on this second piece of paper, uh, which is a cheat sheet of numbers, um, it gives, there's a timeline of um, giving various bits of uh, what's been discovered and what's come on stream, and also um, the amount uh, which has been found so far and put it into context, the comparison with the amount that we already know, which is in other parts of the Middle East. Egypt, for example, 
uh, or, or rather Israel's estimated discoveries, because only a small fraction of that has been proven uh, to be there, we know for sure that it's there, is 30 trillion cubic feet. Uh, Egypt's uh, proved reserves is 77 trillion cubic feet. So Egypt's got is a much bigger gas player than Israel is at the moment and seems likely ever to be. Uh, and, but you've got to put it in perspective that Russia has um, uh, 1,570 cubic feet, uh, which is, you, you know, it, it dwarfs what Israel has. Uh, but uh, so these gas discoveries are important in Israeli terms, but they're not uh, world-shattering. Uh, it doesn't make uh, Israel Saudi Arabia of gas. Uh, and um, the third piece of um, paper is a, uh, a rather graphic map, uh, which I've walked away with from a war game which took place in northern Virginia a, about 18 months ago, um, and um, uh, is, uh, I would argue with bits of it, because it, if you, green is oil and red is gas, uh, according to this, it looks as though Israel's got a chunk of uh, uh, oil um, on the border with the West Bank um, uh, near Kalkilia, um, and the answer is it hasn't. Uh, but we won't go into the arguments of the, today of whether it has or it hasn't. But it does show uh, the Leviathan field, uh, which is the really big Israeli discovery, the Tamar field, which came on stream um, in, uh, in, in the end of March, and the uh, Mary B field, uh, which has been around for about 10 years and is being fast depleted. And it also uh, indicates to you um, offshore gas fields off the Nile Delta, uh, which gives you an indication of um, uh, the amount of gas that uh, Egypt has. Uh, there's, um, and Cyprus has found a field as well, which is in Block 12, um, which is called the Aphrodite field. Now, for the purpose of the discussion this afternoon, I think rather than uh, the speakers speaking for 15 minutes each at a time, I'm going to fire some questions at uh, both of them, and we'll try and, uh, and they can talk for a few minutes in answering those questions to set the picture. And then um, w when uh, we've gone through that, we'll open up for, for more questions. Um, Brenda, if I might start with you. Um, uh, there's been uh, elections in Israel. Um, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu is back, but he's formed a different coalition. Uh, before the elections, um, a government committee had um, come up with the idea that uh, there should be uh, so much of uh, used for domestic purposes and so much for export purposes. Um, from what I read in the newspapers, it seems as though um, the new government is uh, saying, hold on, um, whatever the last government thought about, we want to rethink the issue. Where are we on this? Okay. Um, yeah, first of all, I think I'd like to mention a little bit about this policy process, which Simon mentioned in terms of the Tzemach Commission. Um, it was very unique. I actually served as an advisor to, to, to uh, Tzemach on, on this commission. Um, when I started my work with the commission, he said, okay, you're from the academia. L look around the world and see what other countries have done when they found a big natural resource. How did they manage it? How did you, ha you, know, you have conflicting national interests. On one hand, environment. One hand, uh, making a buck. On one hand, uh, using the gas. One hand, exporting the gas. Says, Tell me what happened when other countries sat, they found a big resource. What, how did they manage this resource? I looked around the world and discovered that most countries, even the countries that we consider very organized, whether the Netherlands, Canada, Australia, very few countries when they discovered these big resources sat down and said, okay, how, what's the best way to promote national interest? So first thing I could say, 
something positive that Israel did that actually took a year, took a breather, and said, how do we manage this resource uh, best? And that's what came up with the Tzemach Com Commission recommendations. They tried to find a good balance between conflicting national interests and do the best for the long-term uh, future on Israel. I can make some comments on the specifics of the commission. Um, I think that, yeah, I mean, obviously they had to wait till after elections and a government formed because there would be no legitimacy for any sort of lame duck or, or, or not that we have lame ducks in Israel because our ducks keep walking to the next government, but, um, but that, that it, to, to make this kind of very important decision which will affect the long, you know, the long term security and economy of the, the state of Israel. Um, next week at the Knesset in the parliament, they're having a discussion, the economic committee, and, and there will be a lot of opposition more from the environment lobby against, against exports or against such, such, such a high level of exports. But I can say that when, I, I assume that in the next couple of months, the government will adopt um, some version of the, of, the, of the committee. I would think pretty close to its, to its recommendation because its recommendation is quite dynamic. It gives a lot, it, it doesn't talk about specific numbers. It talks about if we find this much, this is how much we'll export. If we find this much, that much we'll export, meaning that it, it gives room for some kind of cushioning with mistakes and with, with estimates. Um, but I think what's important, since this is a wider government in Israel, and since it's more focused on economic issues, whether it's the, uh, we have a future party, I don't know, maybe I'm not translating correctly into English, the Lapid party or the Bennett party, that is focused more on the middle class in Israel and social justice, that I think if this government adopts the legislation, it will be, it will have wider public legitimacy than, let's say, a previous government that might have been considered sort of the interests of big business or, or, or something of this, this state. Um, I would say another thing that uh, Israel is a, kind of the train went went forward without even knowing if it had some coal or steam or electricity to propel it. Israel's electricity um, within within five years will be 70 percent based on uh, natural gas, which is a great thing in terms of lowering air pollution, lowering carbon em emissions for Israel. We definitely will be completely on track with any commitments we've made in terms of carbon emissions. You feel it when you go to Israel that it's just the air is better when, the, when we have the natural gas. It's a very good thing for the economy because while it won't necessarily bring cheaper electricity prices, it makes cheaper production of electricity. So at least in terms of government company and, and in terms of industry, they can have a cheaper input into their manufacturing, the same kind of revolution you're having here in the United States. Um, and uh, but, but we are going over to 70 percent uh, uh, use of uh, natural gas for electricity. Um, and so just looking at some of the, the current statistics, you know, if, if when the gas was discovered, Israel was, was, was uh, consuming less than 3 billion cubic meters a year of gas, um, next year will be, just by, for sure, you know, that's already been committed, will be, uh, will be consuming 13.3 billion cubic meters of gas. So it's really, the local market is going to have tremendous demand for this gas. And, and, and I agree with Simon's assessment. The, the big story is more a story of um, not Israel as this big player on the world gas scene, but a really great resource for Israel and hopefully for some of our neighbors, something that can improve our region and not just thinking about, you know, how to, how to sell some resource, you know, to, to, to Asia, or, or, but, but how we can make our region a much more prosperous and healthier place. Uh, yes, um, Brenda, if you could, um, you, you've said gas is being used for electricity generation. What else is it being used for? Um, and uh, my understanding is there's no proposal to use it in uh, domestic houses. Uh, after all, Israel is not northern Europe, and you don't have to uh, have efficient central heating systems. So one good thing about our climate, right? So that, um, yeah, you know, I think that, and maybe Jay probably could also comment on this as, as well. You know, we're the 21st century. It's going to be the era of natural gas. You, you're probably already feeling it by the fact that you read so much about natural gas and you know something about fracking and you're, and you're think, conceiving, you know, you've seen some people with transportation on gas, so you feel it. But, you know, just remember the, 19, the 20th century, oil started out as something very limited for illumination, you know, just to, to replace that whale blubber that was smelly in your houses. So, and then little by little, it started to be used for transportation. Then it, then it went into, uh, into, into industry. Then it went into power generation. As oil became more expensive, um, you know, more demand around the world, so it, it left the petrochemicals, it left industries more or less, left 
power generation, most, most of it, and now it's back to a boutique fuel, basically, for transportation. The same transformation is going to happen with natural gas. I mean, once you have, basically, these hydrocarbons are the same thing, but in different, you know, they're energy, right, sources of energy. So we may, today, more or less around the world, we use natural gas primarily for power generation, you know, for electricity. But it's going, because it's getting cheaper around the world, and it's becoming available in so many different places, so it's so much easier to, to ha access gas, because also of its lower environmental impact, we're going to start using natural gas for a lot of other things. I mean, it will happen in all of our lifetimes that, we, you know, we will see it as a major transportation fuel. Um, it's already becoming a major, you know, feedstock in industry. Um, and, of course, this is a very good news for the environment. I think, you know, you can learn a lesson from the United States here. The U.S. didn't put in place any, you know, carbon legislation, climate change legislation, you know, and we're beating the Europeans in terms of lowering emissions, you know, with all their fancy, you know, legalistic schemes, right, but just by having a cheap, good source of clean, clean energy. So I think... I think there's also a very big advantage for Israel here because of all those technological developments, you know, sticking Israel's neat economy in together with that resource. And I don't know exactly what it's going to look like, but I know that, that they'll come, will be a part of this development of new technologies based on natural gas. And the, and the government, the prime minister's office, put a lot of money now into supporting research on um, oil substitutes for natural gas, um, you know, trying to use how to utilize this. But, I, I, you know, I think that I can't say what the laboratories are going to produce, but I think having this natural gas and knowing that we're entering an era where natural gas-based technology is going to be very important, I think it's a very good thing for the Israeli economy. Okay, and yeah, if, I, I, if I could just add, I, I think it, uh, just to put this in perspective, I think Israel's consumption of oil is about <laughs> 250 or 300,000 barrels a day. And just if I got the math right, um, if you back that out by substituting natural gas, um, you would be saving um, on the, uh, you know, at, let's say uh, at 250, you would be saving about 10 billion dollars a year. So that, that's a, you. So you'd be consuming a domestic product as opposed to importing a foreign one. And I think Israel's GDP is what about? Is it 200 billion or, or it's in the two to 300 billion range? So it's a material number. I mean it. Mm. And it's it's yeah. not the technology is there to use gas for uh, natural gas for CNG certainly as a petrochemical feed. And Israel's got a vibrant petrochemical uh, business. It's an oil-based feedstock now in the north. But if you use natural gas, just like uh, here in the states, you have a, a, a big feedstock advantage for the, the uh, rest of the world. For its energy content, uh, natural gas is much cheaper than oil uh, which is uh, so uh, it, it it's that's the essence of how, why you save money by using the natural gas rather than having to import oil um, I wanted to move on to the export options um, and it, okay Israel is going to export um, how does it export and where are the places it sh sh should export to if uh, in terms of uh, what's most sensible and what's uh, politically most likely. Okay. Um, again, the, the, if there will be export into where it will be sort of a combination between a government and commercial policy, I mean, the involved companies plus the, you know, they'll come with propositions to the government, the government will approve them, but, but won't necessarily decide um, on the export, so, sort of similar to the process in the U.S. with now with LNG terminals asking for licenses to export to a specific place, but not necessarily the U.S. government coming and saying, okay, please export to South Korea, please export to the U.K. Um, but I think, you know, I think that's something that's very, it's actually, I, I was in the previous session, it's something that's, that's interconnected with a major development in the Middle East. As I discussed before, as the, what happened with oil when it went from illumination um, in, in, into petrochemicals and industry and then, and then into power generation. Most of the world has left oil, oil out of power generation because it's expensive and polluting. One of the only part regions of the world that still uses a lot of oil to produce electricity, where is that? The Middle East. Um, and so we have a really, um, and it's, it's a big part of also the economic problems of the region because not only um, do they use an expensive and polluting source of their, for their electricity, it, they actually subsidize electricity widely to the populations. And you see this, for instance, the biggest problem right now in the IMF loans and, and, and 
and other U.S. aid to, to Egypt is dependent on, you know, cut back the subsidies, the subsidies that were meant, you know, to sort of help the poorer parts of the population or in some cases, in the case of many of the Gulf states and Iran, to sort of co-opt the population and to, and to induce some sort of public support, you know, for the governments. Uh, they become a tremendous economic burden. Like, for instance, in, in, in Iran, I, I believe the subsidies of, of energy and food are about a fourth of the, of the budget of, of Iran. Um, and so, you know, most of that, or, or for instance, Saudi Arabia, just by shifting its, its – it has the highest uh, power, uh, the, le- the lowest energy efficiency in the world. How surprising, right? Um, and so just if they would leave oil, go from oil to natural gas uh, in, in, uh, for power generation in Saudi Arabia, they could export another 2.5 million barrels a day of oil. And can you imagine what that would do to oil prices? I mean, that would really – really bring a downturn uh, uh, trial uh, spin to oil prices and of course it would be very good for uh, I mean not that the prices would go down but I mean they would they have more options at least in, you know in terms of for, for revenue um, so the, our region really needs natural gas um, you know Jordan we, we think about the e- Egyptian disruptions to, to, to Israel but the big loser from that was Jordan Israel was able to transfer over you know and now has the Tamar gas um, you know bust Bus prices in Jordan have gone up times three uh, because of the lack of, of the lack of natural gas. Electricity prices have gone up. This destabilizes the country. So, um, what, what I think what Israel needs to do number one, and which makes also the most economic sense because pipeline export is much less riskier than LNG. You, you uh, liquefy natural gas. You invest a lot less money up front. Um, that is to export to our to our neighbors that are very thirsty for this gas. It econom- economically makes sense, and it would probably wouldn't distort the domestic price of the gas to Israel as much as having uh, liquefied natural gas export at the same time as a domestic uh, domestic market. So, I think we have a strong. You know, Egypt itself. We we tend to see the the, the disruption to the Egyptian ga- uh, gas from Egyptian gas to Israel as a political as a political instrument. Um, they s- don't export the gas to Israel because simply they don't have enough gas. They themselves have gone from being a gas exporter to soon to be a net gas importer. They're looking for natural sources of natural gas. So the real reason that they stopped the natural gas exports to Israel was not politics, but simply that for a year and a half prior to the fall of the Mubarak re- regime, they were having regular blackouts, even, even in Cairo. Um, and so, so our region itself needs the gas. It could help a lot. And also, you know, that it could solve the water conflicts in the region as well. If you have cheap gas, you can desalinate, you can create more water. And of course, pollution doesn't stop at checkpoints. So if our neighbors are producing electricity in a, in a, dirty, in a dirty manner, we breathe, you know, children of, children of Ashkelon will breathe the, the diesel plant in, in Gaza. Uh, children of Modin will, will, will breathe the, the air from Ramallah. So we have an interest that our neighbors also produce electricity in a, in a clean manner. Um, if I could now move on to uh, Sir Michael. Um, and uh, if you could uh, please talk to us a little about Cyprus, uh, its uh, relationship with Israel, uh, the fact its Aphrodite field is very close uh, to the uh, offshore, um, the, uh, the border bet- between the EEZ of Cyprus and the EEZ of Israel. That's an exclusive economic zone. Uh, and... Uh, how does gas? Uh, how is Cyprus likely to develop its gas? And what are the range of uh, possibilities for cooperation with Israel? Uh, that's, that's quite a menu, Simon. <laughs> I will. Well, can you keep it to about four minutes? I'll so choose <laughs> from the menu um, one or, one or two items. Well, the developments in Cyprus have been in parallel with the developments in Israel. And the same U.S. company that has been playing a pioneering pioneering role in exploration and subsequently production uh, in the Israeli uh, exclusive economic zone has also been uh, the first player involved in, in Cyprus, Noble Energy. So these developments have gone on in parallel. And the most significant uh, gas field yet to be discovered, offshore Cyprus, um, the Aphrodite, Block 12, directly adjoins the largest uh, field that has been discovered offshore Israel. The debate and discussion in Cyprus about how the gas should be used, um, people sometimes say in Europe that, you know, you don't want to 
sell the skin of the bear until you've shot the bear. <laughs> and some of this debate and discussion, both in Israel and in Cyprus, is a little bit premature, especially in Cyprus, because in Cyprus, none of the gas is really expected to come on stream until the end of this decade. So it's still early days. But the situation is rather different. First of all, because Cyprus is so small. Israel is a small country, but Cyprus has you know, a tenth of the population, more or less, perhaps a little bit more, uh, of, of Israel. And therefore, it will need relatively little of this gas for its own consumption in the future. And so Cyprus can expect to export the overwhelming majority of the gas that it eventually produces, maybe 90% of the gas. So the issue about export options that we briefly touched on, but maybe we'll come back to a little bit later, in a way is even more pressing uh, for Cyprus. Cyprus is also um, a member of the European Union, and the European Union seeks to diversify its energy sources away from excessive dependence on Russia. Now, the kind of quantities discovered um, in the Levant Basin, as Simon said at the beginning, are not such that this could be a game-changer for Europe. But nonetheless, if some of this gas reached the European Union, it could help with the diversification of energy sources. Other factors that really have to be taken into account with regard to Cyprus is, first of all, the division of Cyprus, which is often referred to as the Cyprus problem. This has many ramifications. There's been very active discussion between um, uh, Greek Cypriots and Turkish Cypriots as to the best use of these future resources, even though the bear has not been shot yet. And the two positions simplifying to some degree, the Turkish Cypriots consider that these resources should be shared and that there should be an agreement on how they should be shared out, that if a fund were created, for example, um, that there should be fixed percentages for the Turkish Cypriots and for the Greek Cypriots. The last Greek Cypriot government, anyway, took the view that there's only one legally recognized government in Cyprus, the Republic of Cyprus, that um, for that matter, many, if not most, Turkish Cypriots are citizens of the Republic of Cyprus as well. They have Cypriot passports too, and that they can expect to benefit through the expenditure of the state on health, education, social security, and so on. So the previous Cypriot government didn't even want to enter into a discussion about the sharing of the future revenues from this gas. But this is one of the factors that greatly complicates the situation for Cyprus. Then there is Cyprus's relations or absence of relations with Turkey itself. Turkey does not recognize the Republic of Cyprus, and Turkey challenges the legality of the exclusive economic zone uh, proclaimed by Cyprus and challenges Cyprus's right to drill for uh, gas in the absence of a share-out agreement with the Turkish Cypriot community and in the absence also of an agreement on the delimitation of uh, sea areas around Cyprus. Turkey has a rather radically different view from Cyprus on this question. The map that you see shows a very neat division of waters south of Cyprus into different blocks. But Turkey's view is that Cyprus does not have a right to uh, proclaim unilaterally an exclusive economic zone and to allocate these blocks. Cyprus, um, in Turkey's view, uh, does not have the right to generate an EEZ as an island in the same way as continental states. Turkey also claims that its continental shelf generates rights for Turkey itself, which overlap with those proclaimed by Cyprus. So you can see that there is ample scope for conflict uh, between Cyprus and Turkey over the exploitation of these resources. I first became interested mm -hmm. in this subject in September 2011, when Noble Energy began to <coughs> drill um, in the uh, block that had been assigned to it at the time. And there was considerable uh, saber-rattling from uh, uh, Turkey 
and briefly, at least, it looked as if Turkey might mobilize its military forces, its naval forces, um, in order to challenge Cyprus's drilling rights. Now, I'm glad to say this saber-rattling did not really materialize. Um, perhaps it was only some uh, people in the government in Ankara who took this view. I think perhaps the prime minister was somewhat calmer than one of his ministers who made these threats at the time. But at the very least, I think, issues related to the division of Cyprus and these underlying conflicts between Turkey and Cyprus mean that there is a potential that these gas resources, rather than uh, helping to kickstart new negotiations for settlement of the Cyprus problem, for example, could lead to tensions in the future. And this is one of the reasons why, for example, the German Marshall Fund, where I'm connected at the moment, has a project which is trying to look at ways in which these resources can be used for the benefit of all the peoples in the area and can even be used um, to try and stimulate progress on some of the underlying conflicts rather than exacerbating those conflicts. And, uh, Sir so, so Michael, if I could um, give you another question relating to this. Uh, the uh, Israel and Turkey uh, have had difficult relations for the last couple of years. Uh, there was uh, supposedly a rapprochement brokered by President Obama uh, when he visited uh, Israel and the famous uh, telephone call between uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu and uh, Prime Minister Erdogan. Um, I think many of us are skeptical of what that uh, rapprochement is and whether it will ever revert to anything approaching uh, the heyday of uh, Israel-Turkey relations. But is uh, an aspect of it much um, uh, commented on is that uh, Turkey would like to buy Israel's gas, and, this, uh, and uh, Turkey is both a customer for Israel's gas and an obvious transit route through perhaps to Europe. Um, how realistic is this, um, both diplomatically and perhaps even technically? Well, as you say, uh, Simon, relations between Israel and Turkey have been uh, tense in recent years, beginning with the famous uh, Davos incident in 2009 when uh, the Turkish Prime Minister walked out of a discussion with uh, Shimon Peres um, over references to uh, Gaza. Um, and uh, the very close cooperation that there was between Turkey and Israel um, has uh, diminished considerably in the four years since then. Um, a hopeful sign was indeed the end of the apology crisis, as it was called, and the fact that this seems to have opened the door to some kind of rapprochement between um, Israel and Turkey for the future. Um, nobody knows how far this will go. Meanwhile, Israel has considerably strengthened its relations with both Greece and Cyprus to some degree as a substitute for the close relations that it had previously with Turkey. For example, when it came to military exercises and the kind of strategic depth that Turkey provided for exercises for the Israeli um, Air Force, um, subsequently there have been um, quite close military cooperation with Greece in particular, and um, an agreement between Cyprus and uh, Israel concerning uh, a dialogue over the strategic implications of the energy discoveries and possible search, rescue, and other forms of cooperation, uh, military cooperation, which have not been discussed publicly too much, but have gone quite far. So in the last four years, there has been the sharp deterioration in relations between Turkey and um, Israel, and um, a considerable rapprochement between Israel, Cyprus, and, uh, and Greece. Now, nothing is permanent in international relations. Um, people have said that uh, no permanent friends, no permanent enemies, only permanent interests. And we don't know exactly where this is going in the future. There are some who believe that this is the start of a real revival in relations between Israel and Turkey, that what Turkey can offer Israel is uh, much more considerable than what uh, Cyprus and Greece can offer in the medium term in terms of markets 
um, in terms of strategic cooperation and so on, and that Israel would have an interest in seeing this relationship re-established, if not quite in the warm terms that it had in the past, but at least um, de taking it out of the freezer. Um, others say, let's wait and see. We really don't know whether this first step of the apology is going to lead to a full-fledged reconciliation. Now, I'm sure we'll come to export options um, in a moment, but one of the schemes for the export of gas from Israel when the government has decided on the principle of export is for this gas to be exported to Turkey. Turkey has a voracious demand for gas. Uh, it's seeking gas from whatever sources it can, uh, whether from uh, North Iraq, uh, obviously from Azerbaijan. It obviously depends on Russia to a very considerable extent. Um, and even though the quantities here are not enormous, nonetheless, they're quite attractive to Turkey. So one of the schemes that has been considerably discussed is the construction of a pipeline from Israel to Turkey, and the gas could then be used either by Turkey itself, which seems to me most likely, because the demand is there, and it could be used even in adjoining regions within Turkey, or it could feed into pipelines crossing Turkey towards Europe, and uh, Turkey could be a transit country for Israeli gas. Now, I think all of this is really very premature, given the very recent nature of the apology and the fact that we don't quite know where it's going. There are also major technical issues involved. The sea areas concerned are extremely deep. There are different routes that are possible. One of the routes would be along the coast, which would be through waters offshore Lebanon and Syria. We don't have to t say too much more about that to see the complexity of the issues raised. Other schemes would see the pipeline passing through Cyprus. There are many alternative visions as to how this would work. Um, there is strong enthusiasm for this in Washington. Um, there are some think tanks here who really believe that this is the way forward uh, in the future. Uh, there are others who are more skeptical. Again, I think it's early days, but we're going to hear a lot more about this issue probably in the years to come. Right. Uh, before we open up to questions, I want to pose um, a question uh, for each of you, a uh, slightly different one. Uh, Brenda, um, what, if anything, should the United States government uh, be doing uh, to encourage uh, the development of these gas resources? Um, and, uh, Michael, um, what should Europe, um, either European countries individually or the European Union collectively, uh, be doing? And what, what can it do to help? Um, Brenda, if you could start off. Okay, yeah. Um, first thing, a really um, exciting part of this development and the involvement of um, not just Noble Energy, but a variety of you know, American companies, because everything you know, from the rig, that, you know, the rig that's drilling offshore of Israel was built in Corpus Christi, you know, providing basically you know, a billion dollars there to, to producing jobs there. It's created a connection between Israel and a, and a different part of America that us, usually Israel didn't have a connection with, with, with the oil and gas industry, with Louisiana, with Texas. And it was, I recently attended Sarah Week in, in Houston, sort of the big U.S. oil and gas conference. And suddenly being from Israel was an attraction, you know, to in this kind of audience and, and uh, uh, you know, knowing something about East Mediterranean gas. And it was, you know, a topic of the conversation. And Israel was there being discussed, just like you t discussed Tanzania, Mozambique, Azerbaijan, just, you know, sort of small gas players. And, and, and it was so, so it's sort of a connection to a new America um, or a different America than Israel's had. And, and you see it even in... Um, the city I live in, in, in Haifa, and you see, you know, suddenly a lot of uh, Americans out at restaurants with southern accents. You know, it's, it's kind of a, it's, it's kind of a, you know, we have to tell them Dimona is the south, you know. So uh, um, in terms of policy, I think there's a couple things that, uh, first thing, it's important. Here we have something that's positive that could be in U.S.-Israel regional dialogues, like, for instance, any sort of cooperation we could have with U.S.-sponsored, U.S.-led with Jordan, with the Palestinian Authority, with Egypt. There's a lot of win-wins here. And again, granted, 
commercial considerations aren't always enough to overcome all political problems. Like, but for instance, when you have a, an LNG, a liquefied natural gas facility offshore of Egypt that's 40% capacity. I mean, it's, it's, you have billions of dollars invested that's not being utilized. And actually, some of the companies that invested there, including ENI, they're actually suing the Egyptian government for the lack of gas for, the, for this facility. And on the other hand, you have gas that's looking for a market, not a lot of gas, so you don't want to invest in some mega, very expensive, you know, pipeline up to, up to Europe or maybe an LNG facility that would have to be large enough for gas to, 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 to Asian markets. But here you have something where you could reverse a pipeline about $150 million without building a new LNG facility and get that g gas out to market. So you might have, you know, something that could, again, I don't think gas, I don't believe in peace pipelines, I don't think gas builds peace, but you could have something that still could be a positive vector of cooperation if other things are going well could also add to add to that positive cooperation so i think the u.s and any of its dialogues about um, you know i think support of jordan is obviously a big focus of u.s policy in the middle east right now in the post arab spring uh period the most important way to stabilize jordan is to make sure that it has uh cheap electricity water um you know so this gas creates that kind of opportunity so i think again it should be this this in in, in u.s policy towards the region take into consideration this resource and and on the flip side on the negative side um Russia's involvement in the region um, that, you know, if you, it's kind of hard to understand, and thank you guys for not going to the Syrian panel and coming to our positive panel here. Um, it's kind of hard, hard to understand, you know, Russian policy on Syria if you think of Russian policy in the Middle East, because basically Russia kind of gave up on all its clients in the Middle East. Why is it fighting so hard, you know, for, for, for Assad here? If you think of Syria as a Middle East country, it doesn't make sense. If you think of Syria as an Eastern Mediterranean country, it makes a lot of sense. When you look at Russia's power and influence in Italy, in Greece, in Greece where it's probably going to be buying its, grant, its gas transmission system, and there's a lot of Russian money in, invested there. In Cyprus where it's willing to underwrite a billion dollar loan. If you look at its interest in, in Gazprom's interest, isn't it funny I said Russian Gazprom, I didn't separate those words, but um, it, Gazprom's interest in entering Leviathan, which doesn't make much commercial sense when they have, you know, gas, they have too much gas on their hands, why they would look to enter into an expensive offshore project and they're not really an offshore type, you know, company. Um, if you think of all those things together, you understand why it's so important for, you know, why Russia is so adamant about Syria. They are very powerful in the Eastern Mediterranean. That's, that's one of the only places where their Navy still, you know, shows the flag. Um, so I think it's very important that maybe less in the case of Israel, because I think Israel, you know, understands that it, it has a strategic, you know, important relationship with the United States and, and that maybe, you know, maybe Gazprom should not be so involved in Israel, but certainly in terms of other places in the Eastern Mediterranean, like Cyprus, like, like Greece, but but also even keeping a hand on Israel to make sure that Gazprom um, doesn't get too cozy in the region. It can, uh, Brussels is a force for good. I know that's yeah, a, of course. Yeah, that's a <laughs> challenging I've notion. Spent, I've, spent, <laughs> I've spent 35 years of my life there, so I'd better be. Um, <laughs> well, I think the European Union uh, can play a role in trying to reduce political tensions in the area um, to allow exploration and production to go ahead without uh, uh, the risk of escalation. Um, Cyprus has granted new licenses in the second tender, and European companies have won uh, some of those tenders, uh, particularly uh, ENI, the Italian company, and Total, so, uh, which uh, is quite impressive considering that threats were issued by Turkey, and in the case of ENI have been carried out of excluding the companies from the Turkish market if they went ahead, but nonetheless, these two majors really have gone ahead. So the European Union has an interest in seeing, just as the US has an interest in seeing Nobel Energy and others um, going ahead successfully without political conflict standing in its way, the EU has a similar interest. And I think the EU has a number of strings on which to play. It has very close relations with all these countries. Cyprus is a member state of the European Union, Turkey is negotiating for membership in the EU. Many people are skeptical as to whether it will ever actually become a member. There are many obstacles along the way, but many people think the process is of great value in keeping Turkey on track with reforms and moderating the political um, balance inside Turkey. Israel is an associate of the European Union, as is Lebanon and Syria. So the EU is in a good position, I think, to try and reduce tensions. I was at a discussion earlier this afternoon with a Cypriot foreign minister, 
and in the new government recently formed in Cyprus, Mr. Kasulides. And he said that um, if Turkey uh, made certain concessions, Cyprus would ease up on some of the restrictions that it imposed, the veto, in fact, on some of the parts of the accession talks, the membership talks with the European Union. And one really important part of those talks concerns energy. And there's what we call a chapter in these negotiations on energy. And 26 of the EU's 27 member states are ready to start these talks with Turkey on energy. And until now, this has been blocked by Cyprus alone. And the advantage of opening up negotiations on this subject is that it would be the laws and rules of the European Union that would be the basis for those negotiations. So Turkey would be obliged to negotiate about European rules. And um, Mr. Kasoulidis hinted that under some circumstances, Cyprus might drop its veto. So here are just some illustrations that in the political domain, Europe has some cards to play that could reduce political tensions. If this doesn't happen, for example, people could be really worried that when drilling begins, probably um, next year, in some of the new blocks uh, where licenses have been issued, we could again hear these kind of threats. And depending on the political climate, who knows? They might be carried out. So I think there is a role for Europe in lowering tensions in the region. Now, the Cypriots would like to see an even more active role. I mean, some Cypriots have a vision of pipelines being built from Cyprus to Greece and from Greece into the Balkans and up into Europe and would like to see the EU playing a role in financing um, these uh, pipelines. I do think this is a pipe dream, as is sometimes <laughs> said. But um, there are different ways in which the EU could become involved. But I think its main role is to try and prevent escalation and create a climate in which exploration and production can go ahead and the underlying political conflicts could little by little be tackled. Yeah, um, right. And just as I'm about to open it up for broader questions, I do want to refer to this uh, excellent article in today's Washington Post, um, Israel's Bonanza in Natural Gas. Uh, it's an excellent article. It quotes me. It quotes Brenda. <laughs> uh, uh, therefore, it's excellent. Um, I was it, about to say that if Simon were too modest to mention this, I would have drawn the <laughs> scene. <laughs> and we're really sorry no, you weren't quoting No danger of that. <laughs> um, and uh, I'm amused by it uh, because uh, Israel's bonanza in natural gas, bonanza was the word that uh, Rob vetoed when I was coming up with suggestions uh, for, uh, uh, for, for today's session. There's also a map on this article, uh, which I don't think is on the um, website version of it, uh, which is a bit notional, uh, but um, does cover the export options, uh, but don't, uh, it needs a bit of explanation rather than accept it as completely authoritative. Um, I was going to suggest, Jay, do you have a, um, uh, any comment to make on what you've heard so far? Or indeed, if you haven't got comments, uh, would you like to ask the first question? Um, well, it's, I mean, it's an interesting um, situation. Um, and the, there are some analogies between Israel's challenge, which is what do we do with the gas? Do we consume it domestically? or do we sell it into the international market? And a couple things to keep in mind is when, if you're going to liquefy gas and ship it, you're basically, you need something like 65 to $70 oil equivalent. So almost by uh, force of the economics, um, LNG has to trade at world oil prices. The, just to put this in perspective, in the United States, the where we don't have... Uh, it's, it's really difficult to export LNG because, um, ironically, we build terminals to import LNG, and then all of a sudden uh, we, uh, we woke up and said, holy mackerel, we got more gas here in the United States that you can sh shake a stick at. We got to find uh, uses for it and or export it. But So you need about $65, $70. And w in the United States, we're facing this issue today as well. There are petitions for... Uh, LNG export facilities, um, the domestic users of uh, natural gas, 
petrochemical, fertilizer, steel, aluminum, all industries, ironically enough, that we massively exported jobs from 10 years ago when we had $10 gas or uh, the equivalent of the $70, $70 oil. But now we have the chance these industries are, are experiencing a renaissance, so they don't want to see so much gas exported that we domestically lose the benefit. And Israel's got that, going to have that uh, issue as well, because on the one hand, if you require that it stay in the country, um, you, you, know, you can, I mean, Israel has a big petrochemical complex mm -hmm. in Haifa. Mm -hmm. uh, they have three, uh, I, if I remember the numbers, uh, their refineries produce about 350,000 barrels a day of, of products, all of which is from crude that's imported either from Russia or somewhere else. So if you can substitute and back out, um, back out foreign oil, you can, uh, you can it, it, every drop of oil, dollar of oil that you don't spend, or money that you don't spend on foreign oil is, helps your GDP. So it's, but at the same time, if you, uh, if you require the gas to stay domestic, you may not get as much exploited. So it's, it's kind of, a, you know, in the United States and Israel are, you know, for different reasons, they're at the same, uh, getting to the same decision point. I mean, here, and, and it's, it's a remarkable story. The, um, and there's a lot of talk about fracking and all, but consider this. In, in the year 2001 or two, we produced 2 billion cubic foot a day of gas from the Barnett Shale. Um, now, uh, in the, the United States consumes 66 billion cubic foot a day today of gas. 26 or 28 of it is produced from shale gas. So think of what would have happened if we had had fracking bans in this country. Um, another uh, data point that's quite interesting to uh, us that live on the East Coast, the Marcellus Shale produces about three bees a day of gas today. It's going to 18. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, this is big. this is big, big, big stuff, you know, in our country because of, uh, anyway, I, sorry, that's a, maybe nope. a digression. Well, we'll move on to questions. Uh, I've spotted three. Uh, and uh, after we've had those three, we'll, I'll open up again. Richard first, and then the woman on his right. Uh, could you educate us uh, on oil shale finding in Israel? Could you even discuss that? Uh, there yes. Find, I, well, there was an <laughs> article in Time magazine, I think, this week. Actually, it's on the web Time website. It didn't actually make at least the U.S. edition, um, in which I'm quoted. Oh, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I'm pleased to say that uh, I also managed to explain the story to the correspondent. Um, the answer is there is um, uh, oil shale uh, in Israel, and there's a man uh, called Dr. Vinegar, uh, but I always remember his name as Dr. Mustard, but um, it's, it's, um, it's, uh, who is a former chief scientist of Shell who thinks he's got a way of um, getting it out of the shale. Uh, the challenge on this one uh, is he says uh, he thinks if he can crack this one, uh, Israel has more oil than Saudi Arabia. Um, so you get the drift of where this story is going. Uh, it's sort of in your dreams. Um, this is um, the, the technology uh, doesn't work yet, uh, and the, uh, there is a lot of concern about the environment on this uh, in that um, uh, you'll probably end up with a load of waste water, and nobody needs a lot of waste water in central Israel. Uh, inconveniently, also, uh, it is um, where they are currently working on it. It's within spitting distance of the West Bank, uh, so it's um, politically um, awkward. Um, but am I wrong, or can you add to that? No, first thing you're... You're never wrong. I mean, it's been quoted over and over. And, um, now, I, I, 
g going from Simon's more diplomatic language, I would say I think it's a very problematic um, project. I mean, when, when as Simon said, the technology, it's been tried before in the United States, in Colorado, and there's, there's two issues. One is environmental damage. I mean, in contrast to fracking, where fracking, if done responsibly, doesn't, will not hurt, hurt water sources if it's done by the right people and with the, with the right you know, technologies. But um, where this type of technology can endanger the aquifer, main aquifer of Israel, and that, you know, with the situation of water in Israel is not something you want to do. And also, even if you manage to, what, what Shell got to the conclusion when they did this pilot in Colorado is that it simply produce, if you can produce oil, it would be in a very expensive barrel beyond all the environmental concerns. And again, we have a lot of oil and gas around the world, a lot of places to drill, a lot of places to produce. Um, it's not produced in a lot of places simply because whether, you know, it could be a gas field in the n northern Russia because it's too expensive for their production or it can, you know, offshore oil. And so I, I, I'm, I'm not really sure even, you know, like why, I mean, if, if this didn't succeed in sort of the American economic, you know, to, to get investment, I, I don't, I don't, I don't, I, don't I, I still, again, I agree with Simon, the technology isn't there yet. Okay, so at the back. Yes, there was a map which I nearly made the fourth um, piece of handout um, today, which uh, showed uh, the extent to which uh, the Israeli uh, military would have to uh, patrol offshore uh, according to various different definitions, and it's uh, huge. Um, and um, it, the vulnerability of uh, the offshore installations is a great concern. Uh, the um, Tamar platform, um, production platform, lies off Ashdod, um, which is within rocket range of Gaza, um, and uh, actually was put there and uh, was, it was sunk in position during the latest fighting in Gaza uh, and uh, earlier this year and uh, was it end of last year but anyway but uh, and um, the Palestinians in Hamas didn't appear to realize this um, and so Israel got away with it but that vulnerability remains uh, the notion of an LNG plant at sea a so-called floating LNG plant which um, has been uh, uh, one is uh, uh, being put in position off northwest Australia. Um, now, it's fine off northwest Australia because who's got enemies off northwest Australia? Uh, or indeed, where is northwest Australia? Um, but um, in um, Mediterranean, uh, it's as I get quoted in, um, in this article in today's Washington Post, it's everybody's... Uh, you know, all you need is a boat and a, a guy with an RPG and uh, against a $5 billion bit of floating equipment, um, you're very vulnerable. Uh, and so it's a big issue, but Brenda? Yeah, yeah I think that it's, it's a huge challenge and that, you know, that even no, almost every um, maritime oil and gas facility is, is vulnerable and 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 um, but for Israel's a particular problem one I agree with you the the cost but also the overstretch I mean the basically the Israeli Navy is a coast guard and to, to, to try to to change its mission to something that it really hasn't done it doesn't necessarily have the equipment it doesn't have the I mean it's hard enough for anyone to do it you know even for the US you know to, to do it to, but but uh, um, so so I think it is a big significant concern for Israel and, and Israel did 
made a government decision that it would provide all the security for for the installations. I mean, even the financial side of it, it's not on the companies, it's on it's on the government. So I think definitely should be taken into consideration when you think of, well, you know, what are the economic prospects of an LNG export facility or something, but what are also the economic costs, because that goes for the, on the government. And also, in terms, you know, that Israel will observe, there's very, there's a, it's a voluntary protocol, but it's pretty much accepted in the industry about not arming, you know, local forces, and Israel will, I, I think will adopt that protocol, at least in, in terms of its, its uh, behavior. I think that um, what I tried to do in my work with the committee was actually not thinking about uh, how to prevent attacks, because those can happen, but how do you mitigate vulnerability? Meaning, on the assumption that you have an attack, how do you build your electricity system or your gas supply system in a way that it can sustain an attack? So in terms of, like, redundancy and in infrastructure, dual fuel power plants, have, you know, and, and basically, we've had a test. We had the gas disruption from Egypt, you know, su suddenly stop, and actually the lights didn't go out in Israel. I mean, they actually, they could have, they should have actually cut back probably in, and not provide, you know, but actually we had 100% you know, electricity provision during this crisis time. So the system is quite resilient. So again, I think we should, th you know, and actually it's funny you mentioned Australia, but the largest, you know, disruption to gas supply in, in the history of our, you know, use of gas was not, you know, Russia to Ukraine or to Georgia, it was actually offshore Australia, um, that they just, you know, had a technological glitch on the platform and, you know, for two weeks a part of, a big part of Australia, the, the lights went out. And, uh, I mean, I'm really nervous <coughs> living, you know, in Washington, D.C. I mean, Montgomery County isn't that far away, so uh, it, it could happen anywhere. You have to have resilient systems. Uh, Rafi, and then we'll t I'll take an, another. Uh, stick your hand up, Rafi, so the mic can come towards you. Where it... Actually, my main question and my first backup question were already preempted, so I asked them to back up to the backup question. <laughs> and that's actually, uh, if so much of this is to you. Uh, I hear reports that the European Union is actually encouraging Cyprus to develop as fast as possible its natural gas in order to be able to pay its debts to the European Union. I was wondering if it's anything. I would say the short answer is no. Um, during the crisis, the economic uh, crisis in Cyprus, there was a lot of talk about this, and there was a lot of talk about linking a loan to Cyprus, uh, a bailout loan to uh, the future revenues. But in the event, it didn't happen. Uh, people know, of course, that um, Cyprus will be in a better position to repay the credits that it's received uh, from the Troika once it has revenues from the gas. But there is no formal link, and there's no way, I mean, the EU is not equipped uh, politically or, or technically to bring that kind of pressure to bear. But there is the expectation that those revenues will be there from the end of the decade, and that they will be used partly to offset Cyprus's debts. Uh, yes, um, at the back. Thank you. I, as I recall, and I'm a little fuzzy, so please correct me if I'm wrong, that there have been a couple of challenges, I believe, from Lebanon and possibly Syria, when it was Syria, uh, <laughs> the, about uh, the claims that, that Israel and perhaps Cyprus has on these fields. How did this stand in terms of international law, international agreement? Is there settled law about how one divides and uh, territorial claims, uh, particularly underwater? Uh, yeah. Um uh, I'll try to answer that. Uh, this this would be a whole uh, seminar-long university course, but I'll try to make it in a few sentences. If you look at this, uh, the dispute between Lebanon and Israel is this uh, triangle of red and white. Um, uh, Cyprus has um, signed an EEZ agreement with Lebanon and also signed one with Israel. Uh, in what is a curious um, diplomatic um, decision, which I regard as probably a mistake, uh, the southern point of the Cyprus-Lebanon line was then chosen by Cyprus as the northern point of the Cyprus-Israel line. Um, now, you can't, uh, and therefore it fixed the notional border between Lebanon and Israel. Well, you can't, in international relations, you can't fix somebody else's 
border. Um, it has to be a trilateral agreement in some way. Um, and the difference is based, I think, on two notions. One is that the proper uh, point is probably the southern point uh, of the line, and this is the trilateral point, which is the point which is equidistant between Cyprus, Israel, and Lebanon. Um, unfortunately, the point where Cyprus and Israel agreed is the northern point of this uh, pizza slice. Um, and currently they're working, there are ideas out there uh, to uh, try to bridge this. Um, uh, the U.S. has come up with a proposal, um, but I think uh, Israel doesn't want to go into making an arrangement with Lebanon yet because tell me what's going to happen in Syria, I'll tell you what's going to happen in Lebanon, and then Israel will <laughs> say, well, you, you know, then we'll deal with the issue. Um, if you are Hezbollah, you would probably argue that um, the the dividing line between Lebanon and Israeli waters goes at 90 degrees from the border, uh, i.e. straight out, uh, uh, straight out uh, from the land border. Um, but it doesn't according to uh, offshore border conventions you know, of drawing it. Uh, and But Hezbollah probably argues that because it would say uh, it would then argue that the Leviathan field is partially in Lebanese waters. But uh, Hezbollah can argue this, and frankly, uh, there's no chance that anybody would accept it. More dangerously um, is a line which uh, is a border disagreement which nobody writes about, or I haven't written about yet, but when I've got a bit more information, I will Are you going to get quoted? <laughs> <laughs> is that uh, Egypt regards uh, the offshore border between Egypt and essentially the Gaza Strip, but also Israel, as being an extension of the land border. Um, i.e. straight out from uh, the Israel-Egypt land border. Um, well, not by any definition of uh, law of the sea rules. Um, so this is a, a challenge which awaits us. Um, and I asked somebody in Cyprus uh, whether the, um, uh, the maritime border between Cyprus and Israel actually met up with the maritime border between Cyprus and Egypt, and the answer was, as I expected, no. Um, and so the, there's a, it's not just Lebanon uh, which is an issue, it's also Egypt which is an issue. Um, David Schenker was patiently waiting, and then the gentleman over there. Thanks, this is a, along the lines of, of, of the letter that was asking. Um, uh, I know we have a panel of, of, of analysts here, but uh, maybe we need one of, of lawyers. But um, it, it strikes me that, uh, that, that the problems with, with, with Cyprus um, uh, are entangled with the, pro the problems with, with Turkey. And um, one wonders you know, whether there are uh, legal mechanisms to sort this out, whether there, there is actually a body of international law that applies to to Cyprus claims to be able to exploit its, its resources, or whether this is just too complicated, um, and, and whether Turkey can actually be, be brought to um, to some sort of international court over this, and finally, uh, whether um, Turkey can make all sorts of problems for Israel in terms of explo exploitation of, of the resources along this border. Uh, I think that's one for you, Michael. I mean, both the uh, European Union and the United States have recognized Cyprus's right to um, an EEZ and to allocate resources uh, within it under the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. Uh, Turkey, like Israel, by the way, is not a party, or the United States, um, to the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. And um, Turkey doesn't accept the median line principle um, which has guided the delimitations that Simon was talking about a few moments ago. And Turkey claims that delimitation should be based on 
a negotiation on the principle of equity, which is also part of the law of the sea, the principle of equity. So, I mean, Turkey would like to see a kind of de facto political negotiation on the basis of this principle to delimit uh, the sea areas of Cyprus and Turkey, whereas Cyprus, supported by the US and the EU, believes that it's entirely within its rights under the law of the sea. So it's basically political rather than legal. I don't think there's any basis uh, whereby uh, actions by Turkey until now could uh, give rise to uh, any kind of uh, lawsuit. Um, of course, one could hope that there might be an agreement as to a third party um, facilitation uh, of a possible agreement if the political climate were right. Um, but we're far away from that. So at the moment, the best hope is simply a standoff, and that even though Turkey challenges um, Cyprus is right, and therefore challenges also Cyprus's conclusion of an agreement with Israel that, uh, in light of the changing political uh, atmosphere and the uh, steps towards reconciliation, it's not going to push its view too hard. But I don't see a, a legal solution at this point. Uh, the gentleman at the end, uh, yes, in the middle of on the aisle. Thank you. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, people have been talking. People have been talking about the sense of optimism. I would just like to shift for a moment with a question that may be negative, and I'm putting an extra negative spin on it. Um, there have been reports in the press about some differences between Noble and the government of Israel on taxation of energy. Um, very few international banks have a presence in Israel. A few months ago, BNP Paribas closed its office in Israel. Um, there are discussions in the financial press about the lack of a modern global financial infrastructure in the country. And when some large infrastructure projects in Israel have sought international financing, you almost wonder if there's an echo of the boycott when banks get together. For example, the high-speed train from Jerusalem to Tel Aviv, efforts to put together an international consortia of banks and investors uh, didn't uh, materialize. So given the potential revenue coming into the country and things like corruption that even Michael Warren has written about in commentary, and the lack of banks having a presence in Israel, the echoes of the boycott. Um, how do you see these issues affecting Israel's ability to effectively utilize the bonanza, can I say that word? <laughs> the bonanza that may come from Tamar and Leviathan uh, in terms of Israel continuing down this path of modernizing its country. Sure. Uh, Brenda, one for you. Okay. Um, I don't, not necessarily a negative spin. I think it's a, it's a good picture of reality, which you presented here. I think that, first of all, oil and gas companies, as far as I understand, Jay, you're in the industry, so maybe correct me here if I get it wrong, but what they like from governments is not necessarily something that, you know, favors them, but they want predictability. The hardest thing for oil and gas or in energy, these are long-term investments, the hardest thing for them is policy that changes. Because if you want to know, for instance, like, take for instance that, do you know that one of the companies that it's a promoter of a carbon tax in the United States, can you guys name one of the major companies that, that their CEO is on record for is in favor of a carbon tax? It's Exxon. Exxon, right? I mean, and who would think, right, that they want a carbon tax? But they actually anticipated that Obama would be elected. They anticipated that Obama would actually do something meaningful on, on climate change. There was a subtext there. And, uh, um, um, and so they put a major part of their company, about a fourth of their company value, fourth to a third into natural gas. And if natural gas has much bigger value if you have a carbon tax, meaning that if, 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 it's, if, it's, if it costs money to use coal, which essentially is the alternative, then the value of natural gas um, um, goes up. So, so essentially companies, what they, what they say all the time, fine, put a high tax, put this, but let me know what the tax is going to be. And the same thing in the United States. 
why are oil companies so against cap and trade? Because you, you don't know the price. Well, how do you plan a power plant if you don't know what the price of carbon is going to be? They prefer a tax because they, 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 can, they can know. So I think, I think it, that's sort of a longer introduction to the question. I think in Israel, you know, with, with what happened, I, I think it was a mistake that they did the tax revenue before they did the Temach Committee. They probably should have done the first thing, set the policy in place. But I think the fact that there is a very clear, transparent tax and you can, you know, and a company that's coming in can judge what their investment should be, and that is in legislation and the Knesset, and you know, it's not going to change. I think they really don't have anything to cry about. I can say, but a lot of other countries where I've worked, you know, so much of the tax is under the table. I, I mean, not where I've worked, of course, but but uh, um, <laughs> and that you really, you know, you could, you could, they, a m- number of companies are giving, you know, gifts, let's say, to different officials, and that's not on the books, and that you know that gift that minister can go away, and, and so they're used to working in a lot a more riskier environment in terms of taxes, so to say, than than I think in Israel. Where it's, and, and so I think it is quite transparent; it's quite predictable. You might not like the tax change, but you know what it, a lot of you know a lot of countries, the UK, the United States, have changed their tax regimes on oil and gas. I think you know, so they shouldn't cry too much about this. I think on the corruption issue, I think it is a real um, concern. And there, you know, there's always this phrase about you know we think of a bonanza as something good. But, you know, generally with oil and gas revenue or any mineral wealth, you know, that, that if you have bad governance and you throw in a lot of money, it becomes, good, you know, worse governance, not good governance. And I think there was a lot of expectations in Israel. Maybe it's starting to kind of calm down that, oh, the minute we'll have the, oil, the gas revenues and finally there'll be proper pensions for the elderly and the universities will get money and the laboratories. No, the government's priorities are not going to change because they have more money. They're probably just going to give more to sort of the – I mean, I think it's very – Having a lot of money available for the, with, if you don't change your political priorities, that money is just going to go to sort of the old, the old things like to the yeshivas and to the to the to the to the, uh, to the uh, b- defense budget. So it can, it can be a bad thing. It can reinforce maybe some bad trends in the way Israel used to allocate money. And there is also, like for instance, a concern Gazprom's interest in entering Israel. You know, there's all this is also an overlap with domestic domestic politics. If you had a company like Gazprom. Um, sitting on billions of dollars of investment in Israel. So it would probably become Gazprom Israel and giving jobs and moving money. So can you, you can see, the, for instance, the political overlap with some, for instance, parties which have had, you know, Lieberman is under indictment, is in foreign ministry. You could see that this, this could reinforce a sector which has a history of, corpora- of corruption in Israel. So it is quite an issue we've, of concern. Uh, we've got a uh, very – we've four more minutes, uh, but uh, I have – one, two uh, questions here, and then Patrick, who's been very patient. And we love this audience with all the questions. Yes, you guys are great. I'm just having a hard time sorting out the numbers. Um, if, if Tamar and the Liaton build as they're expected to, I got the part about Israel having a flexible regime between uh, domestic industries and export, but can you just talk through how, how the numbers built for is, Israel alone from what I mean, how, how, does, how does the mechanism of the export versus domestic no, market no. work? Or, no, because okay. I, I got that flexible, okay. but just it, presumably, okay, so Tamar came on the stream a few weeks ago. Right. In 2014, they'll produce more gas than 2013, I would think. I'm just annualizing years because that's the way things usually work. So so um, you talked about Israel with <laughs> 70% of electricity right. production for natural gas. Just, just give a sense of the, you know, rough... Feel for for the timeline and 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 to use the bonanza word again. Okay, it is nice what's going on in 2013, but when does it really become terrifically meaningful from from the Israeli economy standpoint? Right. Well, um, I, mean, I, I can only talk about existing volumes because again, there could be new discoveries. But so far, the trends there are a lot of you know fields that there's a lot of enthusiasm enthusiasm about and they were dry holes but let's say and I'm going to use meters I apologize here but but since I'm going to give you in comparison I think Americans can deal with that um, so let's, let's say Tamar is about 240 BCM and we start getting to about using 13 to 15 BCM a year pretty soon and then up to like 20 BCM by 2020 so you can imagine that Tamar is gone within you know within about 12 to, to, to 15 years and, at the, and so you have two interests one you want to start 
start providing for well, what happens you know, down the line. And also, there are infrastructure problems with providing enough gas from Tamar in terms of the pipeline capacity. And, and also in terms of when we talked about a system that's very resilient, you want to have, you, you'd like to have a second field producing because if you have a, some sort of technical or problem or terrorism, you'd like to have. So there's strong government interest to have Leviathan, you know, in production, uh, you know, maybe with pro- within the next four to five years. And that's why this whole question of how much export and to whom, and it's in some way the, the production to the domestic market is interlinked to, if, is, is there a customer for the whole big you know, so the whole the whole big uh, project. So, you know, basically, a hundred percent of Israel gas now is, is domestic producers. No more import um, from from Egypt, and that you know that's that's right. over. Um, and the idea is for Leviathan to be in production by, you know, again, the, you, you don't have. There's nothing concrete that says that's going to happen. But the government goal would be for by 2017, 2018, for it to be in production. But a lot of things have to happen for that to take place. And the relative size of the um, it's about twice the size, but it's not proved reserves. It's estimated, but... I mean, basically, the, the Israel's domestic demand uh, can be satisfied with the gas so far discovered for probably for 40 to 50 years. And so, uh, and but there's, beyond, even included in that calculation is a surplus. And so um, the sensible thing would appear to be to export it, um, it to monetize it, get the money now. Uh, and as I said at the beginning, uh, we think there's um, a going to slip into BCM, which is a billion cubic meters. We think there's 3,500 BCM out there in the Levant Basin. So far, the amount has discovered is 750, i.e. 800 or so, about a quarter of it. Uh, So there's a reasonable chance uh, that uh, there's much more. And uh, Israel isn't going to become an industrialized country. You know, it's, it can use it for petrochemicals and it can use it on new technologies, but it's it's not going to be um, the industrial northeast of of the United States, uh, so export is um, a, a necessary um, option. I, so, I would just maybe beg to differ there or, or nuance it. One, I would say that just the U.S. Geological Survey numbers, no one uses that as a as a Bible in a sense. Meaning that it's it's still you know an estimate, and you know if you went over the years, you know how close your estimations were to reality. So it's not there's not necessarily that gas is is out there, and I think that. I think we have to look at limited export because even you know even if if you're looking at the way these numbers are going up, so yeah, there's room for um, you know to Palestinian Authority to Jordan, but some major export like an LNG, I think, w- could risk that that balance. And and also I think it's risky. We're at a time right now. Maybe Jay could come in on this, but we're at a time where mega LNG projects are be, are becoming very uh, they're very costly. But on the other hand, the price of gas is going down in a lot, number of markets. So so they're they're also risky economically. You don't, you're not necessarily going to make money off it. And I think that's where the companies sometimes are making I, a mistake. I will take the last two questions, which are here, and then Patrick, uh, and then. Um, if, but can we take them together? Sure. I'm going to sort of the My question builds on just sort of the last part of your question answer. Uh, what are the implications of the bonanza uh, for uh, Israel's relations with the Palestinians? Uh, for example, does uh, desalinization uh, help solve water problems? Uh, are there Palestinian claims uh, to some of these uh, areas? Yeah. Okay, yeah. And uh, t- Patrick yeah. asked his question as well, and then we can uh, decide which ways we're going to answer. Uh, British Gas found gas off of Gaza a number of years ago. Yeah. Could you discuss the practicality of developing that gas um, without cooperation with the Hamas authorities? Uh-huh. Hmm. Um, okay, two excellent, important questions here. Okay, so uh, first thing in terms of desalination, you know, one of the I'll, I'll tell you guys a secret: we have a lot of water in Israel now, we, uh, you know, and that uh, that um, as as much as you know that. Israel really actually provided for, we had this huge challenge, you know, a number of years of, uh, of uh, not enough rainfall, uh, the, the, the Sea of Galilee drying up, and just, you know, when you, when you have to invest in desalination, you have to decide how much water, you know, ahead of time, and on almost over, you know, over, 
over uh, commissioned water. So there's a lot of water available with the cheaper gas coming in. It also could be produced you know, cheaper. And really a, sort of a, an interesting way to export the gas is ex by, by exporting water, meaning that instead of exporting gas and then Jordan desalinates, you export water to them. And this, so, so the, really that the water problems we used to talk about and the element of water and the conflicts is, you know, any master's thesis you guys are writing about water, forget it. You know, basically um, <laughs> there's a way to solve these problems. And I think water is less political than gas, like for, for, I don't know, for Jordan or Syria or something to, imp, to import gas from Israel, that's going to be kind of rough. But if we need less water from the shared water sources, and there's kind of a, I don't want to use this word gentleman's agreement because it's sexist, but let's say a gentleman's agreement that we're taking less water and now you're using it and this is kind of, you know, something for regional, regional stability. So there's a lot of really neat things that can be done with that, with the water and basically to, to remove those issues from the conflicts. Um, yeah, in terms of that, it's very important. You know, Palestinian Authority, um, all their electricity, I mean, Gaza has one diesel plant, very polluting, very expensive. The rest of the electricity to the Palestinian Authority either comes from Israel, a very, we don't get re really proper payment for that electricity. It's sort of a, a, sort of a, you know, a, a gift in a, in a way, not supposed to be, but a, a gift. Um, and they get a little bit of Jordan, uh, sorry, in Jericho, a little bit of electricity from from, uh, from from Jordan there, and that's also problematic with their cur their current supply issues. So, so yes, you know, either through having ability to provide. I mean, I think that basically the Ministry of Energy and Water, it unofficially, but I could say officially, it when it counts on what Israel's uh, water and electricity needs are for the future, and trying to figure out how much gas it can, it it. it includes the Palestinian territories and Gaza, and rightly so. I, mean, I think it's, it's, it's in our interest. Um, in terms of that British gas, yeah, I think, you know, I think this is a really, there's, there's a debate. I know some people, I think, in the U.S. government are more skeptical about the prospects of this, this field. I know that for years, Israel was really against allowing the Palestinians to, to develop the, the Gaza Marine, and I think it was a big mistake in Israel's fault. I think they heard 32 billion cubic meters. Billion sounded so big. You know, it's very small. There's absolutely no export potential. All it could do is help the Gaza Strip have a cheaper and cleaner source of energy. Again, they're using a diesel plant in Gaza. We're breathing it in, in Ashkelon. We have, an inter you know, we have our own selfish interest in, the, in them using the, this field. So, I mean, and even if Again, I'm not the Israeli government official, but so you know, and so what if Hamas was involved with developing this 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 gas field? But um, there's a variety. I mean, I think there has been a shift in Israel, and they are open to some sort of arrangement where this would be developed. Because again, it would take pressure off the Israeli electricity production as well. Instead of us having to provide electricity to the Gaza Strip, they could produce their own. Some people in Israel, I think it's a mistake. They think it's really good we have this lever, you know, that we could shut off the lights in Gaza Strip. I don't know. So far, I don't think that's been such an effective lever for Israel. I think we'll uh, come to an end there.